All right, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Welcome everybody to our uh, second webinar in the series around addressing cognition in medical respite care. I'm really excited about today's topic because it's a new one for us that we don't have a lot of resources on in talking about how we can best support folks with dementia in medical respite. Um, as we all know that not necessarily, medical respite is not necessarily a place for people with dementia, but that often is what happens um, for a number of reasons that Liz will get into today. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Liz Metzger, who is going to um, give our presentation today. And then we also will have some time for questions and discussion at the end. So please feel free to throw your questions into the chat. We'll be monitoring that. Um, and then we'll have time for that discussion at the end. I'm also going to add into the chat um, a notes page that we shared for last week's um, conversation as well. If it's helpful for you, please feel free to take notes in that for today's session. It'll be structured somewhat similarly. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over now to our presenter, Liz. Thanks so much, Liz. Thank you so much for having me, Caitlin, um, and thank you all for being here today to talk about the very important subject of dementia care. Um, and as Caitlin said, while this isn't typically what one would assume when you're in respite, unfortunately, we're seeing more and more of these cases. Um, just a little bit of background on myself before I jump in. Um, I'm an occupational therapist like Caitlin. I thought I was going to work orthopedics my whole career and ended up being drawn to populations with cognitive impairment because they were a challenge, it was a harder, and I sought out so much information to be better at working with those individuals. And that took me to many places. It put me on the board of the Allen Cognitive Network, uh, it took me to being a global professional instructor with the Crisis Prevention Institute, and most recently, it's taken me to being one of the writers on the American Occupational Therapy Association's um, Guide on Dementia Care. So I've been doing a lot of deep diving on dementia, as well as having worked with this population for uh, most of my career. Um, and I'm really excited to get to share some of the information I've acquired over that time that will hopefully serve you in your communities. Uh, before we jump in, I want you to think about somebody that you know that has dementia. Um, it might not be somebody that has been in your care within respite, it might be someone in your family, but what we know about learning is people are much more likely to internalize information if it's associated with memories uh, that they already have. We're going to build upon learning, so we're using that learning strategy right now to reinforce this. I would also encourage you to take notes on that piece of paper you were given or use whatever system most helps you uh, to reinforce information. So today, during this presentation, we have many goals and we'll hopefully get through it in a timely fashion. We'll talk about the definition of dementia, we'll review the most common forms of dementia, understand the impact of dementia on function, as well as identify stages of dementia, as well as people's primary remaining abilities. Additionally, we'll be understanding a variety of strategies for working with people at each stage of dementia, as well as understanding the critical reasoning framework that I use and that you can all use to address the needs of an individual living with dementia. And finally, we'll talk about resources that you can use within your communities to best assist those that are living with dementia. So to start with, dementia is defined as a progressive condition marked by the development of cognitive deficits. And Caitlin did an excellent job talking about what cognitive deficits were last week. Um, and again, there's two different categories of dementia. Dementia itself isn't a diagnosis. It's merely a description of qualities of a condition. So that's important to keep in mind. You shouldn't see a diagnosis dementia. What you will see is diagnosis and then the ones on the irreversible side that we'll jump into in a minute. So the general categories are reversible and irreversible forms of dementia. Reversible forms of dementia are temporary. They typically have a faster onset, and those include things like infection, mineral imbalance, normal pressure hydrocephalus. Uh, there are a variety of causes, especially in homeless populations, where you may see a reversible cause of dementia, but you may also see irreversible causes of dementia as well, and those include um, Alzheimer's disease, avascular dementia, Lewy body dementia, Parkinson's disease, and frontotemporal dementia. So one of the reasons this is very important to know this distinction is because you may have someone in your care who presents as somebody that just has a reversible condition, like, oh, they had an infection, we've treated the infection, but they're not clearing up. That might be an indicator, there might be an irreversible form of dementia as well. Conversely, somebody may have been diagnosed with an irreversible form of dementia, like Alzheimer's disease, but then you see a huge exacerbation in symptoms and 
if a caregiver doesn't know that that is what the person, that's not that person's baseline, then they may dismiss it as a symptom of the Alzheimer's disease and somebody may end up having an infection that goes left untreated for an extended period of time. And that's why we're gonna take some time to talk about the uh, forms of irreversible dementia. So the most common form of dementia that you've probably all heard of is Alzheimer's disease. It's the most common form of dementia. It accounts for about 25% of all dementia diagnoses and it's progressive. So typically people start with mild symptoms and then over time it progressively gets worse. Um, currently there's no way to 100% validate that somebody has Alzheimer's disease unless uh, they do a brain biopsy. However, they're very close to developing uh, assessments that involve both a combination of brain scans as well as blood work that are going to be able to provide definitive diagnoses. This is really important because a lot of the research that has been done on Alzheimer's disease, especially for medication trials, were done on individuals that were later found to not actually have Alzheimer's disease, um, which means that we need to take some of that research with a grain of salt, but also know that we are working towards better diagnostic qualities. And I know for all of you, being able to get a diagnosis might be a starting point and an important part for accessing additional resources for the people in your care. The second most time and common type of dementia is vascular dementia, and this is caused by stroke. Um, so typically somebody will have a stroke and then they're gonna have a decline in cognitive function. The greatest risk factor for having a stroke is already having had one. So if that individual does not alter their diet, um, exercise and adhere to their medication regimen, they're likely to have another stroke and then they can take another step down and another step down. Um, I've personally worked with people that have had up to four strokes and with each one, I see progressive cognitive impairment as well as physiological impacts such as um, hypertonicity in one side of the body, slurred speech um, and additional problems. So being able to know the signs of stroke is also very important because you need to educate individuals in your community on it or potentially make sure the uh, care partners within your community know what those are so that if your individual in your care experiences another stroke, they can receive care immediately. Um, so, and additionally, once somebody's experienced a cognitive impairment, we'll talk about this more with mild cognitive impairment, that individual is going to have a much harder time creating the lifestyle change that's necessary to prevent future strokes and may need more supports put in place in order to help them maintain their current level of cognitive functioning. Uh, the third most common type of stroke is called Lewy body dementia, um, and it's on the Parkinson's spectrum, and it presents with symptoms including um, like the shuffled gait that we see with Parkinson's disease, postural changes, the kyphosis, the shoulders coming forward, soft voice quality, swallowing challenges. Uh, these individuals will also be taking similar medications that, to people with Parkinson's, but they might be more sensitive to them. Um, and interestingly, this one presents with hallucinations, uh, which can be either challenging for the person or reassuring for the person. We'll talk a little bit more about how to address hallucinations in a while. Again, if you have an individual in your care who also has hallucinations at baseline, it may be really hard to tease out what exactly is going on. And again, that's not your responsibility, but knowing that that could be a part of that diagnosis may be beneficial. Additionally, this individual tends to have huge fluctuations in abilities. So in the morning, they don't even look like they really even need to be in respite. They seem like they should be just out acting like a regular person in the world. And then by the afternoon, they might be having a hard time even getting out of a chair. Caregivers can sometimes confuse that fluctuation um, as the person being stubborn or defiant for care, and that can cause more conflict. So when you have somebody admitted, if they have Lewy body dementia, for any of the care partners in the community, knowing that information is going to be extra beneficial to make sure there's not additional conflict surrounding uh, that component of their diagnosis. Um, finally, frontotemporal dementia is the fourth most common type of dementia. It used to be called primary progressive, or it used to be called Pick's disease, and it's characterized by primary progressive aphasia, which is long term for changes in speech. Um, so the person is going to have harder time word finding. We're going to have more word salad, and then typically personality and communication challenges precede memory loss. Um, so this one time I met this flight attendant, and she was telling me when I 
I tell anybody that I work in the fields of dementia, I get the best stories. Uh, but she was telling me about her father who had been like a sweet, mild mannered man his entire life. And then out of nowhere, he started like acting really rude and mean. And he was verbally abusive to his wife. He divorced her, married someone new. Three years later, he got diagnosed with frontotemporal dementia. So um, these individuals um, can be more volatile. They can be more aggressive at times. So again, knowing if somebody in your community has a frontotemporal diagnosis is really valuable for care partners. Um, this one also typically affects younger people. So you have normal onset is closer to the 50s, whereas with Alzheimer's disease, onset is normally after 65. Um, about 100,000 people a year are diagnosed with dementia under the age of 65. So it's not a huge sample, but knowing what we do about the homeless population, you are much more likely to see individuals both with Alzheimer's disease and frontotemporal dementia in your communities than probably the standard population. So dementia is a problem because it doesn't just impact one thing, it impacts everything we do. And function is everything that we do. So there's four general categories of how I think about everything that everyone does during the day. And this is my training as an occupational therapist, but it's also common sense. Um, so the first one is emotions. So these are going to be your feelings. So an individual with dementia, like anyone else, is going to be able to experience joy and love, but there also may be times when they experience frustration or anger. And depending on where they are in their dementia progression, they may not have the words or the insight to tell you exactly what's going on. And that's a really important piece of information for you to have. And we'll talk more about emotions shortly. Um, sensory is the second category. And so when we think about senses, we obviously think about the five senses, right? So we have hearing, taste, smell, sight. Um, I'm forgetting one, smell, sight, and touch. There it is. Um, but there's also some additional hidden senses. And those include interception, which is your body's awareness of its internal organs. Um, so whenever somebody's like, I feel hungry, you're using your interception. And that's a it's a ability that actually does get impacted by dementia. So somebody may have a decreased insight into their body's needs. So they might not realize they're hungry or thirsty. They may not realize they need to use the restroom. And obviously that can cause a lot of challenges. Um, I know personally I get hangry and if I don't eat regularly, that's going to impact the way that I interact with everyone around me. So my husband knows to keep me fed. Um, so in your communities, obviously, especially for homeless individuals that may be experiencing food insecurity, keeping people fed is obviously a very high priority because that could cause an escalation in behavior and make someone unhappy. And we want people to feel comfortable in our care. The third component is going to be physical abilities, and that's our ability, body's ability to move through space. These include things like balance, strength, range of motion, the ability to swallow. And as dementia progresses, we do find that people lose some of these abilities. Uh, for example, in middle stages of dementia, people are going to still have the ability to use their hands and like do buttons, but as it progresses beyond that, they're going to lose that ability and may have more trouble feeding themselves. Finally, cognition. Um, and Caitlin spoke amazingly about this last week. This is what our brain needs to do to get through the day. So these are going to include executive functioning, memory, attention, problem solving, sequencing of activities. And again, knowing that dementia impacts all of these, we need to keep that in mind when we're providing care to, to anyone within our communities. And just to be clear, when I use the word communities, I am referring to the places where you work. I'm sorry I didn't say that earlier. I try to use language that... Um, reinforces that where you work is where some people are temporarily living. And for some of them, they may not have permanent homes. So where you are working is maybe the closest thing they felt to a home space in quite a while. Um, so that can be their community. It is probably, it is definitely a temporary situation, uh, but we wanna make sure that we treat them like members of our community, because obviously the way we treat people is going to impact the way that they treat us. And we'll talk more about that later in this lecture. So um, thinking about the direct impact of emotion, about all of our components of function on, on individuals with dementia, we also can start to think about intervention strategies. So for somebody with dementia, they may not have an emotional state, their affect may not be congruent with their actual mood. So 
I sometimes refer to this as a blunted or flat affect where the person doesn't show a lot of facial expression, but that doesn't mean that they're not having emotions. And that can make it harder for care partners to gauge where that person is. Additionally, if they're new to your environment, they may be experiencing a stress of being with new people in a new space. Um, they may, in many cases, have a trauma history, and so they're more likely to have heightened emotions. Um, finally, um, they may just have baseline uh, stress from the experience of being homeless. And knowing all of that and knowing what you know about trauma-informed care, which I know is a part of everything that you do, we need to be aware of that. So the first thing we need to make sure is that we're always evaluating emotional state. Um, so in the 90s, we started assessing for pain in healthcare. Right. Um, so in addition to um, checking for uh, blood pressure, oxygen saturation, heart rate, those sorts of things, we also assessed for pain. Incidentally, we started assessing for pain the same time we had pain medication. So the idea was we were checking for pain because we knew there was something that we could do about it. Um, so pain became the fifth vital. So I want you to think of emotions as being the sixth vital. It's something that we should always be checking for because there's something that we can do about it. If somebody's having a hard day and we're aware of it, we can do things to help them meet their needs to hopefully elevate them to a place where they feel calm and comfortable within our community and are able to do their best work. Um, additionally, we need to meet people where they are. Uh, so when somebody is having a harder emotional day, I don't show up into somebody's room peppy and high energy because that's not where they are in that moment. And that might make them hate me or it might make them not want to cooperate with me that day. So if somebody's low energy, I want to try to match their mood as much as I can, um, even sometimes down to body language to let them know that I am feeding off of them. People with dementia are masters of nonverbal communication. So they are much more likely to read what you're doing and sometimes even more so than what you're saying. So being mindful of where your body is and where your face is is incredibly important. Uh, there's this phrase called West resting witch face. I don't know if anyone's heard of that before we're approaching Halloween, um, but typically it's defined and it's sadly more common in women, maybe, or maybe we just call women out on it more, uh, where it sort of looks like you're permanently mad, even when you're just resting your face. So it's kind of like an eyebrow raise situation. And it's really important that if you have this condition, which some of us do, that you bring your eyebrows down. So if you've ever been in a situation where somebody says, people just always seem to not like me, the first thing I always encourage people to do is to figure out where their eyebrows are and to let them rest because an individual with dementia will pick that up and they will assume it's about them, even if it's just the nature of who we are. Um, so again, we want to provide people with opportunities to talk about their feelings. We can't force that, especially because individuals may be very guarded. And again, given where they are with their trauma experiences, they might not be there for it. But if somebody seems open to talking to you, uh, get down to eye level, be within a range where you feel like you can maintain eye contact and try to be present. And whenever possible, provide positive support. Uh, people respond well to feeling um support it in a way that's not condescending because again these are adults uh, for you sometimes they're even older adults and we still want to convey respect so for individuals experiencing dementia they have many sensory impairments that accompany their diagnosis so one is going to be a decrease in their visual field of attention so for you as an adult you're driving a car you can see a stop sign 60 feet away and know that you're slowing down for an individual in middle stage dementia they're not they may be able to see that far but they're not paying attention to what's happening that far away so if somebody startles when you're walking towards them it may be because they're not seeing you when you're six feet away and they hear you first but they have no idea who you are um, so that's one thing to keep in mind that somebody's visual field may be much smaller they also, again, have that decreased insight into interception. Um, so they may not know that they are having hunger or thirst signs. Um, for pain, there's a separate pain scale for people with dementia based upon facial expressions because we can't always assume that on a scale of one to 10, they're gonna know where they're falling in that moment. Um, and also somebody may not know that they need to go to the bathroom until it's too late. Um, and again, that's a tricky space. Caitlin and I talked about that a lot with figuring out how to maintain continence as much as possible while also recognizing um, that for some of your individuals, there may be other factors going on that limit their ability to use a bathroom. 
Um, they may also have difficulty filtering out sensory input, and this is going to come into play with attention as well. So if you're talking to them and there's somebody else in the room that's talking as well, they might not be able to focus on you giving them an instruction. So whenever possible, we want to try to limit distractions in their space. Uh, finally, taste receptors change. Sometimes people with dementia will complain that food doesn't taste as good as it used to, or it doesn't taste the same. Um, the last receptor to go is the sweet one. So I have a lot of care partners that actually add either sugar if the person's not diabetic or another type of sweetener to people's food because then they can taste it better and that can help with PO intake. Um, and also just trying to get us giving people opportunities to smell as well, because if somebody has a pleasant smell, they're more likely to salivate and that's more likely to trigger the desire to eat. So again, we need to keep things close to an individual, try to eliminate distractions whenever possible. If they're comfortable, if you're comfortable closing a door behind you so you don't have hallway ambient noise, it's really good. Um, provide frequent opportunities for basic needs. Um, so instead of asking somebody, do you want me to get you a glass of water? Having the water, they're like, here's your water, would you like some? That's going to be more likely to promote people um, engaging in those basic needs, um, especially with toileting, making sure people are getting up regularly to use the bathroom. Uh, timing voids for like a half hour after meals, also helpful. Um, and again, offer those dietary appropriate seasonings. Um, Mr. Mrs. Dash is another great one for people that have that, have that salt craving, but maybe are on a low sodium diet um, and try to make that need. Finally, for physical abilities, we see individuals that have decreases in balance, they're high fall risk, and we see an impaired swallow as we progress more through these stages. The impaired swallow could be mechanical, so it could be related just to the physical thing, or it may also be involved with the attention where they're not focusing on what they're doing. So importantly, we'll talk more about these later as well, but we want to limit the environmental hazards. So if you're walking in a room and it seems like there might be something that's a little bit blocking away, might as well move it. Provide regular opportunities for physical activity. Um, so in a lot of communities, and again, it's in respite, medical respite, your settings might be slightly different, but in a lot of hospital settings and nursing home settings, there's an emphasis on getting people to stay still. Um, and in doing so, that can make people really antsy. Um, and especially like thinking about the homeless population where maybe walking and moving around was a beneficial thing and helped them get energy out. We wanna provide opportunities for movement whenever possible. Also, when somebody's eating, watch for frequent throat clearing or coughing. That could be an indicator of aspiration, meaning the food is going into the lungs instead of going down into the stomach, in which case it's going to be really important to get a referral for speech therapy to do a swallow eval just to make sure that they're not aspirating because that puts somebody at a very high risk for pneumonia. So again, that of those three boxes, the fourth one was cognition. We're gonna talk a lot more about cognition within the context of dementia. Caitlin did a great job introducing these concepts the other day, we're reinforcing them now. So for people with dementia, Typically speaking, most forms of cognition are going to be a weakness. And so when somebody has a weakness, we need to come up with workarounds. So short-term memory, so information that you're given within three to five minutes, that's your short-term memory. As Caitlin explained, that information can move into being stored for longer term, but sometimes that doesn't happen because of impaired short-term memory or even attention. Additionally, um, uh, areas of, oh, that was wrong. Um, an area of weakness is also new learning. So if you're asking somebody with dementia to learn a new skill, to use a call light, to use a new cell phone, that's going to be a much bigger ask. What they are going to be stronger at is their long-term memory, both for better or for worse. So this is going to include um, especially uh, events and memories that have strong emotional responses. So people will remember um, birth, deaths, um, special holidays, um, trauma events. Trauma events stick very hard in people's brains. Um, and then additionally, procedural memory is going to be good. So I had an individual, um, this is, there's a video on uh, my old company's website on this, where they had a gentleman in middle stage dementia, meaning this man had a hard time dressing himself. He needed help putting on his pants, but he was a pilot. So his son took him to an airfield, took him up in an airplane. And then he asked his dad, who's in middle stage dementia, if he wants to fly the airplane. And the guy says, yeah. So he flies the airplane totally appropriately. And then the son asked, do you want to land the airplane? He said, oh, yeah, I can do that. And he lands an airplane. So this is an individual that struggles with getting dressed, but he's able to land a plane because he has a procedure for it. 
So the more you have procedures, the more you know about people's procedures, the more you can use that to their advantage and to your community's advantage. Um, so to account for those weaknesses with short-term memory, always introduce yourself. It doesn't matter if you've seen the person every day. I always make it a point to also have my name badge facing outward and to get close enough where if they can read, they can see it. And like, hi, it's Liz from Occupational Therapy. So that way they don't feel like they're supposed to remember who I am. Also never saying, do you remember? Um, it's, it's triggering and it's mean. And there's not really a value in asking somebody if they remember information, better to just repeat it. So when it comes to these weaknesses, we need to limit the need for new learning whenever possible. So I always think about what somebody has to know and what they might need to, might want to know and really focus on those things. For somebody in early stages of dementia, they are actually going to be pretty, they can do new learning, but it's going to take a few weeks to reinforce and they actually have to really care about it. You can't, like with children, you give them information, they're like sponges, they just soak it up. With older adults, you have a full sponge already. So to get more information in there, they really have to want to acquire that information. Whenever possible, play on existing routines. Um, just because it might be convenient for you to get somebody up at 630, if they normally get up at 10, let's start the day at 10. And let's say that they like to put on their socks before they put on their pants. If that's the order that they do it in, so be it. Um, and again, when you're aware of positive long-term memories, when you know what those are, you can ask the person to share that information if they're comfortable. This can be really helpful if somebody's experiencing anxiety um, to help redirect them. If you can pull from a long-term memory, that can really help to calm people down. Um, conversely, we want to know about long-term memories, especially when it comes to trauma. We might not know what a traumatic event is itself, but we may know what causes or triggers the trauma experience. And that's information that we need to make sure that we don't hoard. That information needs to be shared with everybody on the staff. Um, so in terms of we, um, attention, there's four different categories of weakness of, sorry, of attention. There's selective attention, which is where you focus on one thing at the exclusion of something else. So I'm talking to you, even though the TV is on in the background. Divided attention, which is where you're multitasking. And there's good research on this. Nobody's good at multitasking. Um, typically, what you're actually doing is switching attention, which is where you focus on one thing and then you focus on another thing. And finally, we have sustained attention, which is where you're focusing on one thing for a prolonged period of time. So here, you've been sustaining your attention here with me more than 25 minutes. That is significantly longer than you have for somebody with dementia. So for somebody in middle stage dementia, their attention span typically won't be more than seven or eight minutes. And knowing all of those pieces can be really helpful for your interventions for those individuals that you notice have attention impairments. So for one, eliminate all environmental distractions. I've said it before, there's no way I can repeat this one enough. Eliminate anything in the environment that's going to distract someone. Um, additionally, you might need to eliminate things that are distracting somebody internally. So if somebody's experiencing pain, that's going to be a distraction as well. If somebody's feeling hungry, that's a distraction as well. Um, provide time when changing the task. So if somebody is eating a meal and then they decide to go to the bathroom and they come back to the meal, you may see somebody pause at the meal. And that's because they need additional time to reset their brain from doing one activity to doing another activity. At the same time, you'll notice this with somebody in even earlier stages of dementia, where if you're talking to them while they're walking and then you ask them a question, the walker is going to stop, they're going to stop, and they're going to tell you what the response to your question because they can't do both things at the same time. Um, so we don't even think about that as being multitasking, but it truly is. Uh, give people extra time and break tasks into smaller pieces. So getting dressed seems like it should be pretty straightforward and you can do it in two minutes. But for somebody with dementia, they may need to put on their shirt and that might take a little time because of range of motion limitations, attention challenges, and then they might need a rest break. Uh, one of my favorite sayings in therapy world is, um, sorry, I need a quick sip, is cognitive rest break. So cognitive rest break, giving the brain a break. That's when it doesn't have to think. That's when it doesn't have to do anything. Uh, for those of you that work out, if you've ever had the experience of weightlifting and then you get to fatigue and then your muscle needs to actually take a break before you do your next rep, 
It's the same way with brains. Brains need to take regular breaks. Um, and if they do, then you'll find that people are able to achieve more. Um, I've also had individuals in my care who I'll be working with and then will be doing stuff. And all of a second, they just stop. They stop listening to me. They stop doing anything. I used to take it personally until I realized that it wasn't really about me and their interaction. It was that their brain was just done and it needed to rest. So if you're seeing someone that's experiencing that, give their brain a break, let them rest. So thinking about how to apply this information correct or in a way that makes sense, um, I'm very fond of the cognitive disabilities model by Claudia Allen. Uh, she was an occupational therapist. She spent years working with people primarily with mental illness at first. So uh, she did most of her early research on individuals living with um, bipolar disorder and schizophrenia and uh, created her model based upon them. And it not only is about how to intervene on individuals with dementia, but also how to categorize the severity of deficits. So we're going to start by talking about how you think about approaching an individual with dementia, and then we'll talk about each of those stages next. So very simply, we are gonna be talking about can-dos, will-dos, and may-dos. Can-dos are someone's abilities, so that's gonna include their emotional abilities, their sensory abilities, their physical abilities, and their cognitive abilities. Their will-dos, which are their interests, and the may-dos, which are their possibilities. We live in the may-dos, we are the possibilities but we need to discover the other components of them in order to reach those possibilities. So for example, if you have an individual in your care who can walk and they can eat, and you know that their will-dos include interests in sports and cultural food, you know that you're going to be able to get them to walk to the dining area to watch the football game and eat a favorite meal. Um, I once worked one of the most Stubborn, and again, that's a word that we sometimes associate with people with dementia. They're not demented, they're just stubborn. It's like, no, they actually have dementia and they are also stubborn, but that's besides the point. So um, she would not really do anything with me in therapy. She had pneumonia, she was deconditioned. Um, she would mostly just glare at me during therapy and not do anything at all. Um, but one day when I was taking her back to her room after therapy, her family was there and they were talking about how much she loved Christmas. And even though she couldn't really say a lot at that point, because she was in, you know, middle stages of dementia, she lit up and she smiled. So the next day for, so now I knew one of her will do's, who will do was Christmas. So the next, and I had a feeling based upon what the physical therapist told me that she did have the ability to stand up, but she needed some help. So the next day for therapy, I cut out a paper like Christmas tree and put it up sort of higher on the wall and then made ornaments out of more paper and put tape on the back. And I asked her to decorate my Christmas tree. She grabbed the ornament out of my hand and she stood up and put it on the tree. I'd never seen this woman stand before. Like I just hadn't, but I was able to come up with an activity that met her interest and therefore she was able to do it. So when you think about what somebody cares about and what they're able to do, you can create the situation in which they can be successful. Um, so that's just a general framework. I use it with most of my, um, with basically all of my patients. I don't limit it to my individuals living with dementia because it's empowering to know that I can always try to do something different to help somebody be successful. So to talk more about those candies, we need to know an in individual stages of dementia. For the purpose of this presentation, I'm only covering uh, mild cognitive impairment to middle stage dementia. The likelihood of you seeing somebody in late stage dementia is just relatively unlikely. And if that's the case, then you're going to need a, probably more support. But um, so for individuals with mild cognitive impairment, uh, Caitlin talked a lot about this earlier. Um, I'm giving you age comparisons here as well. So this is from uh, Reesberg, who created the theory of retrogenesis. You don't need to know that. Um, but the idea is um, what goes, so people in, like grow in the same rate at, or in the same way in which they decline. So you can compare stages of development to stages of dementia. So for somebody with mild cognitive impairment, their brain functioning is similar to that of a teenager and somebody in their early 20s. To be completely clear, when we talk to individuals and when we interact with them, we still treat them as adults. We are not condescending. We don't baby them. We don't treat them as the developmental age comparison because that's condescending and rude and they deserve more respect than that. But it gives us a sense of what their remaining abilities are going to be. And that way we can set up just right challenges for them to make sure we're meeting them where they are. So when we have somebody that's in their teens or early 20s, from a cognitive standpoint, and they have mild cognitive impairment, typically they can follow simple written instructions, assuming they are literate, 
they only note the primary effects of an action. So an example of this is the person that says the car crashed, not I crashed the car. They don't necessarily the role, see the role they have in it. And these individuals use trial and error problem solving. And Caitlin spoke to this as well. We need to set people up for success. We don't want to give them opportunities to fail here because even though we can learn from our mistakes, individuals with dementia and individuals with mild cognitive impairment are less likely to be able to learn once they've made that mistake. And then they're, we're just reinforcing them continuing to make that mistake again. Um, and again, somebody with a mild cognitive impairment, they may be at that level because they will eventually develop dementia, or they may be at that level for a variety of other reasons. So just because somebody is exhibiting mild cognitive impairment does not mean that they have dementia. So for individuals with mild cognitive impairment, we want to assess for literacy and keep any written instructions very simple. Uh, we also want to assess for health literacy as well, especially if they have medical conditions that they're going to be expected to manage on their own. Um, and I know that your organization already has great resources on health literacy. We also want to assume problem solving is going to be limited. And so we want to limit the possibility that there are going to be any problems, and we want to anticipate those problems for them. Um, so as Caitlin was talking about last week, if somebody's planning on taking the bus to an appointment, they may not have the insight to know that, oh, the bus might not come. What do I do if the bus doesn't come? Well, what's my backup plan? So anticipating for the person and planning that out in advance is going to be really important. And also having a mechanism of writing that information down if possible. Um, people with mild cognitive impairment also can benefit from like external cue structures. So they may be able to use a cell phone. They may be able to keep a note section. They may be able to maintain a calendar. Um, and that's a really great thing to reinforce early because uh, if it's in their system, it'll last for longer for them. And so then they may be able to continue to use that through the early stages of dementia as well. For somebody with early stage dementia, they are going to have the cognitive abilities of, so low early dementia is going to be developmental age comparison of around four, and the higher end of early stage dementia is going to be closer to age 12. So that's a pretty big range. For these individuals, they are going to be goal-directed and familiar activities. So you say get dressed, they'll know when they're done getting dressed, and they will try to do it with good quality. They will follow routines. They will not follow your routines. They will follow their own routines. There is some new learning, but it does take more time. So estimated it'll take about three new weeks to create new information in their brains. And also they are capable of simple problem solving. So again, it's not going to be anything complex. We wanna to try to keep things as basic as possible and ideally limit the amount of problem solving. So again, as far as strategies go, provide familiar activities with familiar end results, create consistent routines whenever possible. Um, these are my individuals who I will bend over backwards with to make sure I make my appointment times correctly, because if you're 10 minutes late, they said, well, why are you 10 minutes late? You said you'd be here at 1030 and it's 1040. And that's not okay with them because they like their routines. Um, determine again, we talked about this earlier, what's new learning is essential and what isn't limit yourself to what is absolutely necessary and as well as limiting problem solving. Finally, middle stage dementia, these are individuals that are currently functioning with a cognitive ability, ability of 18 months to three years old. So this stage, I would assume you don't see a lot of this, but I do want you to know about it just in case it comes up. So these individuals have the ability to grasp objects. They have hand-eye coordination. They can feed themselves. They notice the effects of their actions. So if they tip over the water, they'll notice it's spilling and try to clean it up. And they will follow one-step directions with cueing. But the kinds of cues they're going to benefit from most are visual cues and touch cues. Verbal cues are not going to be as helpful at this stage. Um, and typically speaking, when I'm working with someone, especially if they're feeling overwhelmed, they may be dropping a level. So just because somebody typically has early stage dementia, if they didn't have a good night's sleep, they might be functioning in middle stage. And I mean, I've done this myself. If I was up with the baby all night, am I safe to operate a car? Probably not. It doesn't mean I don't do it, unfortunately. But we need to keep in mind every time we interact with someone, we don't know what their meds are feeling like in their bodies. We don't know, necessarily know how they slept. That might be shifting where they fall in this continuum. So as far as strategies for middle stage dementia, be strategic about where, what objects you put in reach. Anything that's close to them should be safe for them to engage with. Typically people won't like 
When you think about an 18 month to three year old, you think about kids putting things in their mouths. Older adults have experience, they have lived, they typically won't put a familiar object in their mouth if they know what its purpose is and it doesn't involve their mouth. But also make sure you give them stuff to engage with because if you keep their space totally barren, they may get bored and seek out other opportunities for sensory input. Uh, provide opportunities to safely use hand-eye coordination. Um, I've had individuals that really like brushing their teeth, so we let them brush their teeth a lot. Uh, lots of eating opportunities. Uh, people may be more into snacking at this stage than eating a full meal because their attention doesn't really allow for sitting down for a full meal. Um, provide lots of activities and things for them to interact with. What's great about middle stage dementia is because they're not goal directed, they'll do the same activity frequently. So if they like an activity, continue to give them opportunities to do it. Um, and again, provide appropriate cues. And I, my default is to typically go for tactile cues first, um, or sorry, go for visual cues first. I don't like to touch people unless I know they're okay with it, and then potentially go for touch cues if it seems like we need that to guide beh uh, behavior more. So with all of, so I just threw a lot of information at you, but now I'm going to give you something familiar, right? You all perform patient-centered care, right? And so that's where we put the person at the focal point of caregiving. Um, the person that really spearheaded this movement in dementia care was called, was named Tom Kitwood, and he wrote Dementia Reconsidered um, in the 90s. So at a time when we were still doing doctor-centered care, uh, care, he was doing person-centered care for people with dementia. So this is incredibly important for individuals living with dementia. Um, I recently read a meta-analysis that found that if you person-center, the more you person-center activities for an individual with dementia, the better the outcomes are. So it's not just like person-centeredness works, but the more and more emphasis you put on person-centered care, the better the outcomes and the fewer the distress behaviors, which makes complete sense, but it's really cool to see that validated in an actual study. Um, so again, make sure personal choices are honored whenever possible. Care partners are gonna take time to get to know the person they care for and share that information. We shouldn't see a person have to repeat the same information that's important to multiple care partners because everyone on the team should know exactly what the triggers for that individuals and the preference whenever possible. Uh, we want meal times and wake times to be based on personal preference. Temperature and lighting also need to be based on personal preference whenever possible. Um, touch is only provided with consent um, and bathing uh, pre preferences are met whenever possible. And bathing can be a very sensitive thing for individuals, especially with dementia. Refusal of bathing care is one of the main complaints of care providers. Um, some of my typical suggestions is being okay with sponge bathing if the person doesn't want to shower. There's no rule that people have to take showers, especially if they're uncomfortable. Um, I come from a long line of Holocaust survivors, and I do not blame anyone that doesn't want to take a shower, especially if you were in Auschwitz. Um, so if somebody has a negative association with the shower, honor that, let somebody sponge bathe, not the end of the world. Other individuals, I've had people take showers wearing full clothing. And that again is a way that somebody can maintain their uh, modesty, especially if they're of a different gender than the person providing care to them. Um, and when we don't sort of consider those, we're kind of denying that person's, be denying their role in citing them as an adult by sort of saying, oh, well, you shouldn't have a problem being naked in front of me because I'm caring for you. And that doesn't feel comfortable for most people. So general care approaches, and again, I'm gonna cue you to your handout because you may find there's useful stuff to write down here. Um, so as far as building alliances, um, remember that behavior influences behavior. So this is the resting witch face. This is the body language. This is your energy when you walk into a person's room, try to meet them where they are. Um, if you just had a bad interaction, don't bring it into your next interaction with you because the person that you are working with will pick up on it. Um, always ask permission before you touch someone, especially their belongings. For individuals that have experienced homelessness, they may have an extra connection to their belongings, and that is important to keep in mind. Um, I trained a care partner once who um, found 20 rotting bananas on the countertop of a patient. She went to go grab them to throw them out, and before she knew it, the person had a walker over her because she was taking his stuff. Um, she did not get permission before she did that, and it is really important, even with food that's rotting, or especially with food, to get permission before touching. Um, always approach someone from the front. Don't come at people from the back. Again, especially for people with trauma histories, this is really important. Always introduce yourself. Um, keep your body language open and facial expressions positive or at least neutral. Um, and consider your tone of voice and inflection. A lot of individuals also have hearing loss and they may not have it as a diagnosis. 
I always talk to people in my low voice because it's easier to hear instead of yelling at them. When you yell, you raise your octave and it can actually make it harder for someone with a hearing impairment. It's also incredibly annoying. So especially if, if you do have a high pitched voice, if you can work on developing a lower voice, that might be helpful. Um, also changing the activity. So if somebody's struggling with a task, try to make it easier or eliminate the hard part. So if you can limit standing, if that's a challenge for someone, do that. If there's a fine motor component, like unbuttoning a shirt, make sure that's already done. If a person's struggling with a task, try to break it down into smaller pieces. So don't just say, get dressed. Instead, say, here's a shirt, grab it, put it over your head. So we're breaking it down into more manageable chunks and choose preferred activities um, over those that feel undesirable. Because again, always thinking about not what you need to do, but what the person in your care needs to do. And that might be a very different list. And if you're not considering their list or you're only thinking about your own list, you're putting that person in an unfortunate situation where they're going to have to tell you or show you that they don't wanna do what you wanna do. So for creating supportive environments, again, check the lighting in a room, check for shadows. So um, especially if you have people that are around in the evening shift, go near the head of the bed of where it is in the room, turn off the lights and see if there's any creepy shadows, especially if somebody's already experiencing hallucinations or if they have Lewy body dementia, those shadows could get extra scary. Um, so make sure the lighting is working for, um, if, it's, if it's freaking you out, it's probably gonna freak them out too. Um, consider temperature background noise. Um, Again, this is a tricky one because sometimes rooms are just set up the way they are, but if you can adjust where beds are, if you can put the bed in view of the toilet, there's an increased likelihood the person will actually use the toilet instead of using something else. Uh, for some individuals, a urinal may work if they're interested in it, if they're having a hard time getting to the bathroom on time. For individuals with a history of prostate problems, they may not have as much notice to go to the bathroom. Briefs are acceptable. I know especially there's challenges with worrying about soiling clothes. So if that's what has to happen, I get it. Um, but ideally, people don't lose their continence until like middle to late stage dementia. So some nobody should be entering your care continence and leaving incontinent if they're in early stages of dementia. Keep signage at eye level and use simple wording or even visuals when possible. Um, so again, if signs up high, that visual field of attention, that person's not gonna see that sign. And if they don't know where their laboratory is or if they don't know where the dining room is, that could be a real source of frustration. Remove clutter, keep needs within reach. So again, their needs, not your needs. They may need to see their wallet at all times. Their wallet might be empty, but they need to see it. Um, I have a ton of old ladies that need their purses. Their families bring in empty purses, but they always need to have their purse with them. If they don't see their items, they may try to go look for it and that could pose a potential safety risk. Keep stimulating objects in the environment when possible. Honor door preferences. Um, consider if the location of the activity is appropriate. Brushing teeth at the side of the bed doesn't necessarily register the same way brushing teeth at the sink does. So if a person is used to using a sink for teeth brushing, let's try to make that activity happen in the right space because it will trigger more of that procedural memory. And then consider if there's any environmental triggers. And so again, this comes back to the concept of trauma-informed care, which I know you are all doing and I know how valuable that is. Um, but just as a reinforcement, um, so we use the word behavior sometimes in a lot of settings, which is the communication of a feeling, mood, want, or need versus a crisis, which is a moment or time of intense difficulty, trouble, or danger that needs immediate attention. Um, so typically, if we're seeing a distress behavior, something has already gone wrong that we probably could have prevented earlier that we didn't, oops, and we don't want that to happen again. So knowing what triggers someone is really important. And similarly, for people without dementia and with dementia, they may have similar triggers, but the person without dementia may be able to communicate or recognize those triggers and tell people about it more easily. So in the external environment, um, the environmental cues not being effective, signage being bad could really stress people out. Um, an overwhelming environment, super hot, super cold. Uh, if they have an itchy clothing on that they're not used to wearing, if the lighting is bad, um, if they're low vision and they don't have good lighting and they can't see and everything looks like a shadow, that could be really stressful. Um, tasks don't match the cognitive level. So if you're asking somebody to do something kind of complicated, like fill out paperwork and they're low literacy, that's not gonna be a good match. Um, if they have an uncomfortable chair or bed, that can be causing an internal factor of pain, and pain can definitely cause more distress, as well as other people in the environment. Um, currently, my um, grandfather-in-law is in late-stage dementia, and 
my father-in-law was convinced that he was just behaving that way or he was acting out more um, because that's just part of it. And I was like, no, that's not how it works. And it turns out there were two other gentlemen who recently moved into the community who were also walking around and they were running into each other and pissing each other off. So if you have individuals in your community at the same time, you may need to manage some dynamics uh, and you may need to run interference because again, people can be stressors as well. Internally, um, if somebody's experiencing a metal condition and if somebody's short of breath, for example, that's going to raise their heart rate. That's going to cause racing thoughts. That's going to make people very uncomfortable. That could absolutely cause distress. Um, an unmet restroom need, if somebody's either sitting in urine or feces, or if they really have to go and they don't know how to ask for the bathroom or don't know where it is, that could be really stressful. Being hungry or thirsty, having pain. Um, visual impairment. And again, um, you may need to get a referral out for an ophthalmologist or optometrist for an individual in your care if you do notice that their vision isn't ideal. Um, poor coping skills, unmet needs to move. People need to walk sometimes. Sometimes working off extra energy is just what someone needs to not feel stressed anymore. And again, trauma history. So Caitlin is going to put up uh, a quick um, I don't know how many of you are doing this right now, but if you do see a distress behavior in your community, you should always be debriefing that event because insanity is doing the exact same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. Um, so this is a quick sheet that you will take less than like eight minutes for you to do with anybody who observed a distress behavior and basically breaks down to what happened, what were the possible triggers, what did we do? And obviously those didn't work. So what are we going to do next time? And it sort of also follows the formula of what we're going to change about the routine and the environment and the activity to maximize this person's function and hopefully prevent future distress behaviors. So again, Caitlin showed this chart the other day. Um, and just to reinforce, everybody in your community has a role in providing good dementia care. Um, it doesn't fall on one person. Um, everybody should be involved in that care process um, from increasing supports to identifying community supports. Um, you know in, who in your community can request assessments. Um, make sure that your care partners, especially the people providing direct care, feel empowered to talk to those other um, care coordinators so that they make sure that the needs of those individuals are being met. Uh, because if they don't even know that those are options, they may not come to people with challenges that they're seeing from that individual in their care. Um, so, Additional resources I want you to have. The Alzheimer's Association is a fantastic organization. They're not just good for Alzheimer's, they're good for all forms of dementia. Uh, their website has a lot of useful resources and handouts. They also have a great 24 hour hotline, so you can always call where they have information on um, seeking additional care, doctors, that sort of stuff. So, um, always a useful resource, both for caregivers, personal caregivers, as well as institutions. Um, the Aging and Disability Resource Center, um, they also have a hotline and they also have access to a bunch of different resources that exist within the community. Um, so a lot of resources are 50 plus. So if you have individuals in your care that are over the age of 50, to, and again, for younger than 50, if they have disabilities, oftentimes they'll qualify for similar services. Um, so again, a good hotline to reach out to. Um, the Department of Aging, um, so the area Agency on Aging, each region has its own office. They have a national hotline, but also each area has its own um, resources and can include information on housing as well as senior helplines. So those are gonna be very unique to each state. And those can be, the Area Agency on Aging from my experience has been a fantastic resource. Uh, and finally, the Alzheimer's Foundation of America. I noticed on the call last week, people wanted to know about getting individuals diagnosed. Um, so the Alzheimer's Foundation, three days a week, they do memory screens virtually. So this is not a diagnosis. This is not going to go in the chart as saying, oh, the Alzheimer's Foundation diagnosed my person with Alzheimer's disease. But what it will do is give that quick screen so that you have more information to bring to the medical provider to say, hey, we did this. I feel confident bringing this person to you because I do think that we have somebody that is experiencing the signs of dementia. Um, so internal resources, you know, you have stuff on incontinence and medical respite. Um, and again, I feel very passionately about continence. Um, it's a big part of maintaining dignity. Um, so please make sure that you're looking at those resources. There's a lot of valuable information there. Um, and I think I have a few minutes left for questions because I talk fast. Um, so can I answer any questions from the group? Feel free to unmute 
and or throw your questions into the chat. We probably have time for one or two if folks have them. I have a question. Yeah. Hi, my name is Jessica and I'm in the St. Louis area and we're seeing a lot, or I'm seeing a lot of this because we're connected with our hospital providers. And um, some of those individuals that are at the more severe stage of dementia, mm -hmm. um, they're still saying that the person is safe enough to be sleeping out on the street. Um, and we're just finding some challenges and how can we help or improve their safety when they're in the street? Cause we don't, we lack shelter beds and we don't have respite in our area. So well, I would go to the department area on aging um, because they, so, and again, this is also an individual who doesn't want to be housed. You're not going to be able to force them into housing. Um, if somebody feels safer sleeping on the streets for whatever reason, or if that's their preference, we can't help that. But if they are interested in housing um, and they're again, over 50 department area on aging is a really good resource. Um, if somebody is going to be sleeping on the streets, um, obviously trying to have them in as a familiar of a place as they're used to being. So instead of just dropping them where you think they're gonna be best, you wanna find out where they feel the safest. Um, and again, just because they have a routine for that space, they know how to navigate it better. Um, may be helpful. Um, but ideally, if those individuals are receptive to being housed, talk to the department area on aging. Caitlin may also have better suggestions on this too. Sure. I think part of the challenge too is that oftentimes when there are folks who come into respite who are experiencing homelessness, who present with cognitive impairment or early signs of dementia, there's sort of like one or two trajectories is, is folks are like, oh, they're not safe to be housed. And so they sort of remain homeless until things get worse enough to be institutionalized. And oftentimes the only um, place that people end up going is in long-term care facilities, which I think is a huge challenge and not always the best okay. option for folks. And so it can be really hard to figure out is, you know, is this person safe to live independently in a new apartment setting? Because there's usually not an in-between where people can go where they might get more support. So I think, you know, Liz and I are OTs, so obviously we're pro-OT, but getting a functional assessment of like really what is somebody's safety skills, if that's available, can be really helpful. Um, but if folks are saying they are safe enough to be living in the streets or in the shelter setting, then hopefully they would also be safe enough to access housing resources once they're available. That doesn't answer the issue of not enough affordable and safe housing in the communities, which is that gap where we're seeing a lot of folks um, staying. And so I think that that's a challenge. I don't know that I have a particular answer to that, but really, if you can get some providers who can really assess function and not just identify symptoms, can be really helpful to figure out let's move this, let's work on moving this person into housing versus saying, well, let's wait until it's bad enough and then they can go into long-term care um, and prematurely institutionalize people, so. And that would be, yeah. And, uh, yeah, and again, occupational therapists do great functional assessments. Um, we do a really good job of identifying exactly what someone can do in their areas where they may have challenges. So get those right. Yes. Um, so we are just about at the end of our time. So I am going to launch our poll. If you all, before leaving um, today's conversation, would please um, complete the poll for us. Give us some feedback that helps inform um, what we do and what we put together in the future. Um, as we're closing out, I want to give a huge thanks to Liz for your presentation today. Um, I know we didn't have a ton of time for questions. We had a lot of content this week and last week. These webinars, as well as the handouts, will be posted on our website with our webinar information, so you can share them, go back and review them, um, download the handouts uh, for resources for yourself. So those will be available in a couple of weeks for all of you. Um, and if you have further questions, please reach out to us. Um, you know, if it's individual TA, maybe we can provide some support or connection for folks in the community. Um, so as we're launching the poll, otherwise I'll say thank you to everybody. Um, I will put my email in the chat. Thank you, Jessica, for that reminder. So my email is in the chat. Please feel free to reach out again for, for questions um, or other need for resources um, we can help dig up for all of you. So um, everybody, it's four o'clock. We're at the end of our time. Thank you everyone again for coming today um, and we look forward to seeing you in future activities. Thanks everyone.